السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا محمد بن عبد الله عليه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم We're going to continue inshallah with the works of Imam al-Nawawi We're looking at the first volume of al-Majmu'ah And we're looking at the chapter of the importance of busying oneself with learning about Allah and his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and learning how these things can imp- implement themselves and be implemented in our day-to-day life. Now we spoke about the virtue of knowledge, we've mentioned a few statements of the Qur'an and we're going to continue with a few statements from the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which is the manhaj of Imam Nawawi. He says, that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported from Sahl ibn Sa'd al-Sa'idi radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Ali radiallahu anhu فَوَاللَّهِ by Allah ya Ali meaning to you ya Ali or others who follow in this example فَوَاللَّهِ by Allah لَإِنْ يَهْدِ اللَّهُ بِكَ أَحَدْ that if Allah was to use you as a source of guidance for anyone خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمْرِ النَّعَمِ It is better for you than to attain the greatest wealth that you seek. And at that time, that great wealth was a female red-backed camel that was 10 weeks or 10 months pregnant. That was the greatest form of wealth. You know, you have a camel and it can produce children or offspring that you can sell. So the Prophet ﷺ says, it's like in our context, It's like saying, it's better for you than to become a millionaire. It's better for you than to have whatever dreams in this worldly life you seek to accomplish. It is better for you that Allah uses you, meaning as a tool in someone's guidance. We need to pause here with this hadith for a second. Hidayah is of two types. The Prophet ﷺ says, لَإِنْ يَهْدِ اللَّهُ بِكْ If Allah was to use you for hidayah. In other places we know, قُلْ إِنَّ هُدَى اللَّهُ the guidance of Allah is the Huda. Here the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu is talking about Allah using you as a part of His guidance. Could you imagine being chosen? That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala from amongst others in mankind uses you as the tool, as the key to someone's heart that unlocks faith. That darkness changes to light. That shirk becomes iman. That unrecognition, not knowing Allah, becomes surety of faith because Allah chose you to be that key and that light that is shone upon a person to lead them to faith. And therefore, when we look at us as an ummah, we are all in the balance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And therefore, every righteous deed that we brought, we call it, that we do, we refer to it as sunnah. Someone before us did it. What does the word sunnah mean in Arabi? It means a path that people follow. Sunnah fil shay. It means a path that people say, hey, there's an alleyway this way, come this way. Don't cross this side. This is the sunnah. This is the marked, clearly lit path. So everything we do in worship of Allah has to be the sunnah of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa You can't bring your own thing. So therefore we always talk about sunnah, 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 sunnah. Why is that important? Because everything you do is really given in reward equally to who? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who taught you what to do. And equally we see that everything taught to the Prophet sallallahu was in following those who came before him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to our Nabi Muhammad in the Quran, وَأَنِتَّبِعْ مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفًا You, ya Muhammad, and those who follow you, follow the path of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Follow the path of those who came before you. When we come to pray, Jibreel taught the Prophet how to pray. When we come to fast, the instructions of the Quran, when we pray taraweeh, how we recite the Qur'an, which ayah came before which, all of these were instructions given to the Prophet Muhammad 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ma yantiqu anil hawa. He is not given to the ability to speak with his own volition or his own insight into the matters of faith. It's always in huwa illa wahyun yuha. It is a revelation that is revealed to you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And therefore, when we hear this hadith, it should really inspire us to being from those who seek to attain something of knowledge that we can pass on to someone else. How beautiful it is for a person that they stand in front of Allah on the day of judgment and they taught a child, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَد You might ignore this and say, oh, well, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَد You know, it's insignificant. No, this is a third of the Qur'an. It is a third of our theology. You have to look at it from that perspective of the words of the Prophet ﷺ. لا تحقرن من المعروف شيئا Never underestimate a good deed you do. It's those little things that we do habitu habitually, recurringly, that lead people to a path of righteousness that are the greatest forms of salvation for us on the Day of Judgment. For you to answer someone's question, or to remove someone's harm, or to bless someone with joy instead of sorrow, or to share insight into some confusion, or to be insincere in advice to someone that leads them to a correct path instead of a wrong path, you are favored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have now become an instrument used by Allah in the guidance of others. And therefore the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would make the dua, Allahumma hdina. Oh Allah, guide us. Have you ever thought about the Prophet ﷺ making this dua? This is a man وسلم, who Jibreel comes to with the Quran. He is the source of guidance for humanity thereafter. And yet even he is asking Allah for guidance. Allahumma hdina, wahdi bina. Let others be guided by us. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is an important step in our recognition of the virtue of knowledge. Whatever you have, keep in mind that whatever you transmit to someone else, it is counted for you even if you have forgotten of it. Even if decades have passed, even if lifetimes have passed, even if you have been buried that, uh, more than a hundred, hundreds of years, such as an Imam al-Nawawi, here we are giving him reward. Better for him than if he was alive. Him being in his grave and us recounting his lessons is better for him than if he was to live that eternal life up to now. He would have more joy in the Akhirah from this than what he would have experienced if temporary joy in this life. He continues. So after he quotes this hadith, he then shares with us the next hadith, which is the purpose of our discussion. He says, وَرَوَى وَرُوِيَ عَنْ أَبِي هُرَيْرَةٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ It's narrated from Abu Hurairah, and the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, that the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ دَعَى The one who makes da'wah إِلَى هُدَى to, to a matter of guidance, the one who calls people to the right way. كَانَ لَهُ مِنَ الْأَجْرِ To him is the same reward. مِثْلَ أُجُورِ مَنْ تَبِعَهُ in equal amount to the one who follows him in that which is righteous. لا ينقذ ذلك من أجورهم شيئا And nothing will they be deprived of their righteous reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who calls people to good, everyone who practices it, he receives their reward while they lose nothing of that reward themselves. And then the Prophet gives the other side of that coin. وَمَنْ دَعَى إِلَى ضَلَالَةِ The one who invites others to a path away from the truth. كَانَ لَهُ مِنَ الْإِثْمِ He will receive in sinful measure the same amount of what they have followed him in. Just like you invite people to Hidayah, those whose actions push them away from Hidayah earn the sins of it. And therefore we need to pause here once again. Many of us focus on the da'wah of instruction. We say, you know, this is good, this is bad, we're talking to people. But we forget the un-da'wah. 
I want you to think of this word. Undawa. Someone's on good and you do something that repulses them from the good that they were on. Someone's coming to the ma- someone's coming to attend a talk like this. Maybe a sister who doesn't wear hijab, perhaps. She's coming. And as she comes in to register, alhamdulillah, all of our sisters wearing hijab. One of them looks at her and gives her a, you know, a dirty. Gives her that look. That unwelcomed undawa. Undawa. She hasn't said anything. Hasn't made a word. Just a look. That made that sister uncomfortable. So instead of walking in and spending a few hours with us and hearing something that will bring hidayah, she goes back to her car and goes home. Undawa. Dawa, it's not just, hey, come, there's a good class, there's a good, co- come with me. But it's also projecting yourself in a way, a code of ethics, a code of Islam that permeates in all the words you say, in all the actions you perform, that leads people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Could you imagine if you were Rasulullah sallallahu and you see these people who come to Iman and who still have the remnants of jahiliyyah, even some of the great Sahaba, Ridwanullahi alayhim, sometimes they would have a mistake and it's a, it's a human nature. Here's the Prophet standing on his mimbar on the day of Jumu'ah and he's giving advice. And one of the men of the tribe of Al Aws, there were two tribes in Medina, Aws and Khazraj. One of them says, Ya Rasulullah, if that man was from Khazraj, we will do this and this to him. So one of the people of Khazar, Sahabi, their leader, he stood up and he said, how dare you talk about my tribe like this? They're both believers. Wallahi, if you tried, we wouldn't let you do it. Allahu Akbar. Fa'ala aswatahum fil masjid. Their voice is raised while the Prophet is on his mimbar, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sahaba. Could you imagine if the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did not, Deal with people with pity and mercy. If he just said, what kind of ignorance is this? All your life I've been telling you, get out of my masjid. You know how, you know in some of our masjid, who are you to, get out. Don't come back here anymore. A man comes to the masjid of the Prophet wasallam, full of hostility. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. He's come for a fight. He's not coming for any reason. And he waits for the time of prayer and in the middle of the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, in front of his noble face, in front of the face of the Sahaba, he begins to urinate. أَعَذَّكُمُ Allah, Allah honor you. Could you imagine someone coming here and standing right in front of us in the camera's brother, men and women, men and women, in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. And looking at the Prophet, and he does this, the Sahaba, they stood up to kill him. قَامُوا عَلَيْهِ They they were going to tear him apart. And the Prophet said, Da'u, let him finish. <laughs> it is something different. Hold on. Now, this guy who thought, okay, as soon as I, I'm going to get ready for a fight, he didn't think he would have to continue until he's done. <laughs> right? So he's like, uh-oh. So he finished. And the Prophet ﷺ said, to the same men, not to him, to the same men who got up to stop him, he said, go get water and you wash it. Allahu Akbar, the Prophet ﷺ breaks them, breaks within them that rigidity. You clean it. And he takes the man to the corner, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he tells him, Ya Hadha, I don't know your name, whoever you are, Ya Hadha, Hadha Baytullah. This is a house built on worship for God. La ta'ud. Don't do this again, because you see those guys? I stopped them once. But if you do it after I talk to you, you're on your own. لا تعود صلى الله عليه وسلم The man says, before that incident I came wanting to fight, I hated no one more than Muhammad Wasallam. But when he did that, I loved no one greater than Muhammad Wasallam. So that man made dua, he said, Allahumma, O oh Allah, adkhilni wa Muhammad al-Jannah. Let me and Muhammad alone go to Jannah, not these guys. <laughs> they wanted to hurt me. 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet laughed as you and I laughed. And he said, Dayakta wasi'a, something so vast, Allah's mercy, you made it so small. Just me and you. So the man, he's still upset. He said, Allahumma adkhilni wa Muhammad al Jannah. And whoever else. I'm not going to say in them. Right? He leaves it open to Allah's mercy. So Allah reveals in the Quran to us, describing the Prophet. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَمْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ Ya Muhammad, if you were stern, without pity, without mercy, they, meaning your Sahaba, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, these great Sahaba, these icons of faith, if you were stern and inflexible and without pity, even these ones would have separated from you sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Andawa, just like you call to good, there are those who lead people away from good. Not because they tell them, don't read this hadith and think, oh, someone who tells you to go to a disco. No, someone who becomes a barrier to another from hidayah. It could be a word, it could be a look, it could be an action, it could be a statement. It could be a feeling you put in their heart. And therefore it leads people away from the truth that Allah seeks to make you a tool to lead them towards it. The next hadith, Imam al-Nawawi continues, Abi Huray radiallahu anhu also reports that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا مَاتَ بْنِ آدَمْ إِنْ قَطَعَ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثِ When a human being passes away, the son of Adam, his deeds that he can earn, that he himself can earn, are cut. Because some people misunderstand this hadith. They say only those three things. No, it's not only those three things. It's only those three things that I, after I die, can continue to earn. But other people can earn good deeds for me. My children can do some, something for me. You can do something for me or for others. The one who has passed away, they themselves cannot earn good deeds except in three ways. Sadaqatun jariya, a charity that continues to be useful after they have given it. They build a masjid, they dig a well, they've done something that is of benefit to others even after their demise. أو علم ينتفع به Or knowledge that remains useful for others that they practice. You teach something, something to someone that even though you no longer live with them or know them or speak with them, that they continue to practice that thing that you had taught them. Or a young or a child who is raised upon righteousness that maintains supplication and invocation and dua for them. Anas radiallahu anhu said, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Man kharaja fi talab ilm The Prophet said, the one who leaves his home, goes out in search of طَلَبِ الْعِلْمِ In search of the sacred knowledge. فَهُوَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ حَتَّى يَرْجَعَ He remains involved in the path of Allah until he returns back to his home. That's a wonderful statement of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. You sitting, me and I, you sitting here today, are engaged in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if our intention is to benefit and prosper ourselves with the knowledge that leads us closer and closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. Every moment you remain, even your idle moments, even having dinner, even going to here and there, even the traffic and going and coming, you are in an act of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi sabilillah, in the path of Allah. Another wonderful hadith is the hadith of Abi Umama radiallahu anhu ardah. Where he says, فَضْلُ الْعَالِمِ عَلَى الْعَابِدِ كَفَضْلِ عَلَى أَدْنَاكُمْ And this hadith is deemed hasan by many of the scholars of hadith. That the virtue of the knowledgeable, the one who learns about faith and practices it, in comparison to just those who learn, to just those who practice without learning, is like the virtue of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ to the least of us. I want you to consider this example that the Prophet gives Sallallahu His virtue to the least of our ummah is like the virtue of those who learn about faith 
in comparison to those who just worship Allah, worship Allah, but without knowledge. The worship of Allah is an essential of our life. But learning about how to worship Allah is more virtuous than just worship. And therefore the Prophet ﷺ sets for us this precedent that we must learn enough of our, about our faith to become not just worshippers, but intelligent worshippers, understanding worshippers of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet continues, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu wa ahla samawati wal ard. Allah, His angels, the inhabitants of the heavens and the inhabitants of the earth, hatta namla, even the insignificant ant that walks by unnoticed. في حجرها, in the depth of its den and home, under the ground, that you don't even see it. وحتى الحوت, and even the fish that swim in the oceans and lakes. ليصلمون على معلم الناس الخير. They make prayers of mercy for the one who teaches good to others. Allahu Akbar. Allah, His angels, the inhabitants of the heavens and the earth, the ants beneath the ground, the fish in the sea. Invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the one who teaches people good. Now I want you to consider the words of the Prophet ﷺ. He's not just talking about ulama. The one who teaches someone good. Mu'allimin nasil khair. And therefore seek to be a tool that brings about good for other people. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in another hadith, he says that those who when you see them, they remind you of Allah. You know, sometimes you meet someone and just because they have a little bit of taqwa, your conversation is not about frivolity. It's not about stupidness. It's about something that, you know, has some maturity and has... These are the kind of people that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is talking about. That just being in their presence, it prevents you from sinfulness. It prevents you from doing idleness that in, and helps you in the way of Allah. One more hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the hadith of Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu, it's narrated by Imam al-Tirmidhi. And this hadith is deemed hasan, it's a good hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says, Ad-dunya mal'una, this worldly life has a curse placed on it. Mal'unu ma fiha, the curse extends to everything in it. So this world has a curse. And this curse touches everything in it, except for four, illa arba, except for four things. Illa dhikrullah, except the remembrance of Allah. Wa ma walahu, and second, what helps the remembrance of Allah. So the remembrance of Allah, what aids and helps others remember Allah? وَعَالِمًا وَمُتَعَلِّمًا And those who are endowed with knowledge, the scholars, and those who are seeking knowledge. Those who are in the process of learning about Allah. Now I want you to understand this world. You're going to say, Brother Yahya, that's, that's a terrifying hadith, and it is. Why is the Prophet saying everything is cursed except for four things? Does that mean this water has lana? Does that mean the clothes? What, what does this mean? This worldly life has a curse on it. Cursed is everything in it, except for four. The remembrance of Allah, what helps the remembrance of Allah, the scholars and those who are learning about Allah. How, how come it's only four? What it means, is that everything other than these four things, when you use them, there's no, there's no benefit after it. They've come to waste. You eat some food, khalas, it's gone. It's finished. There's no, there's no permanency or eternalness for it. Nothing remains, it's gone, it's finished. Now, I need to explain a very essential belief that we have as followers of our Prophet Muhammad that the life that we live my dear brothers and sisters 
when we come out of our grave, when we wake up, and I use these words intentionally, when we wake up in our grave, it will seem like the 60, 70 years we've lived were a dream, that they were a mirage. And Allah tells us in the Quran, we're going to whisper to one another. We're standing there on the day of judgment. How long were we asleep? Maybe a day or two. The life you lived, and in fact, when you calculate it, it's true. The day of judgment is 50,000 years. The 80 years that you live is like an, a day or two in comparison to the 50,000 years. You're going to come out of your grave and you're going to say, Qalu man ba'athana min marqadina. Surah Yaseen. Who woke us up from our sleep? What happened? This whole life, as Allah tells you in Surah An Nur, it's like you are living in a desert and when you come to that thing you thought was real, you come and you think, ah, oh, I've attained happiness. It's a mirage. But he finds Allah there. Everything in your life, there's always this concept, oh, the grass is greener. If I have two valleys of gold, what does the Prophet say we will look for? Third one. You have two valleys full of gold, where's the third? Let me look over that hill. Single brothers, I can't wait to get married. Then they get married. No. <laughs> then another one, no, inshallah, no. Single brothers, oh, when I get married, everything is going to be beautiful. Then they get married, and what happens? It's tough, it's not easy. Being married, very stressful, right? Especially when you thought it was green and... Horses running and pastures and flowing water and oh my clothes will be ironed and who needs, who needs my mom anymore, I have a wife now and sisters they get married, oh I can't wait to get married, we're going to talk all the time, I will have a partner, Allahu Akbar, then they get married, you don't find what you want. Everything that you married the man for or you married the sister for changes. Ah, look how, mashallah, she's so beautiful, brother Yahya. Yeah, but with years. No, uh, sisters, don't get upset now. With years, with children, with time, with stress, with burdens, the beauty that was, was not. And the husband, oh yeah, oh, he's got a great job. Mashallah. I, I, I love his job. He's going to have a good income. Alhamdulillah. I hate your job. It keeps you away from me. I don't see you. You're traveling too much. But that's why you married me. Oh, my husband, he dresses so sharp. Mashallah, I love the suit. All of a sudden, why are you dressed up? Who are you trying to impress? Who's there at work? What's happening? Right? There's always this thought... <laughs> and then you come to it and you cross that bridge and you find that it is not what you thought it would be. It is not the way you thought it would be. Except for Jannah. It is better than you thought it will be. And therefore Allah names the things in Jannah with the names we have in the dunya. And you're going to say, we used to have this in the, in, in the dunya, we used to have bananas, talh. And then you say, oh, it's not like that dunya, that uh, brown talh, brown mushy bananas. No, this is jannah. Different to what you think. Better than what you estimate. The dunya, mata'ul ghurur, is deception that the shaitan makes you seek. You're after it. You want, I, oh, it's going to be better. It's going to be better. No, it'll get better. Everyone always says, oh, don't worry, don't worry. It'll get better. It's not going to get better. It gets more difficult. It gets more hard. This is the dunya. And therefore the ulama, 
when they hear these words of the Prophet ﷺ, that's what it means. الدنيا ملعونة If you are seeking the worldly life, know that it's cursed, it's temporary. It will never be forever. You will never enjoy it the way you thought you will enjoy it. The money you assume will not give you the joy that you seek. How many wealthy people cannot live with themselves? How many wealthy people cannot have anyone live with them? You look at a well, you have so much money, why can't you find happiness? It's not money that makes you happy. You look at some very destitute poor people, happy family, kids are sleeping in, in, in the same room with their, happy, close knit, loving, tender, because the dunya has that curse on it. Why are these four things removed? Dhikrullah. What does the word dhikr mean? Everything that reminds you, not of God, that you will stand in front of God. Dhikr. It's not remember Allah. No. It's remember you're going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Remind them, because the reminder benefits the believer. Remind them they're going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remind that husband, remind that wife, remind that son, remind that daughter, remind that teacher, remind that minister, remind them. Zakir. When you say Alhamdulillah, it's oh Allah, I acknowledge you. So that when I see you on the day of judgment, don't write me from those who were negligent in remembering you. You're going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. الذكر وما وله and what helps the remembrance of Allah sometimes you need someone to remind you to the remembrance sometimes the, the thing is in front of you but you don't see it we had a, a young child that we just prayed Salatul Janaza upon Ibadallah La ilaha illallah Dhikr that's remember it reminds you to remember Allah Salatul Janazah, yes, you're remembering Allah, but it reminds you that's going to be you. That could be your child. That could be your loved one. If not you, it could be someone you care for. Ittaqillah. Keep aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of a sudden, the pain that was experienced by a family becomes for you an ayah from Allah, a sign of your need. To be ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's dhikr. And that is what helps you to remember Allah. So the brothers who printed off the material, the books that were written, the people that speak, they are engaged in the remembrance of Allah and helping others remember Allah. Number three, the ulama. Because they're the ones you ask about how to protect yourself when... In the next life, you come to the imam and you say, is this halal or haram? I don't want to do haram. Why? Because I'm going to stand in front of Allah. <laughs> and the one who seeks to bring good for others by being able to be asked about how to protect myself before standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Al-Imam al-Nawawi, after quoting a few hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which we've narrated some of us, some of, he begins to talk about the statements of a salaf He says, وَأَمَّا الْأَثَرُ Now Al-Imam al-Nawawi uses this wonderful word, al-athar, the footsteps or the traces of the salaf, of those who came before us. Those who walked that path that the wa Prophet walked. As the Prophet ﷺ walked the path of Ibrahim, his sahaba walked his path, the tabi'een walk their path, the tabi'i tabi'een walk their path, we walk their path, right? He says, they said, Ali radiallahu anhu, make note of this wonderful statement of the great Sahabi Ali. He says, Kafa bil ilmi sharafan. Knowledge shows its virtue. You should know the beauty and the wonderfulness of knowledge. That the one who doesn't have it, pretends to have it. The one who doesn't have any knowledge, he wants people to think he has knowledge. She wants people to think 
They should ask them that question. And when people ask him or her, they don't know, but they just feel joy that people are asking them because it means, oh, they think I am knowledgeable, more knowledgeable than them. And how evident is the disfortune and the evil of ignorance and yatabarra'a minhu man huwa fihi that the one who is ignorant pretends they're not most people they say oh yeah, yeah i know you sure you know or you think you know many people oh no no i know you sure i'm not sure i think i'm sure so there are four levels of knowledge write this down inshallah general knowledge we're not talking about islam general there is what is called ilm Knowing something with precision. Ilm is knowledge that is precise. It has dhabt. Then there is jahl. The opposite of knowledge is ignorance. Where a person knows they don't know. So that's an ignorant person. In between knowledge, knowledge and ignorance, there is dhan. Dhan is unable to separate indistinguishable things. Meaning someone is unable to separate the ambiguous of things. It could be this or it could be that. I ask someone, what's your birthday? This is my birthday, that's knowledge. You ask them, what's uh, Brother Yahya's birthday? I don't know, that's ignorance. You ask someone else, he says, oh, I think maybe no, that's dhan. And Allah says in the Quran, وَإِنَّ الظَّنَّ لَا يُغْنِي مِنَ الْحَقِّ شَيْئًا Dhan cannot ever be made to be equal to haqq. Dhan, it's just thought. It could be true. And it could not be true. Fourth is الجهل المركب. Compounded ignorance. Jahl المركب. What is compounded ignorance? That someone doesn't know, but thinks they know. That is the worst level of ignorance. Someone who is jahil, but thinks they are alim. Someone who thinks they know, when in fact they don't know. And therefore the imam, they would always say, knowledge is to know you don't know. Ignorance is to think you know. <laughs> Allah ibarak fiki. Mu'adh ibn Jabal, the Sahabi of the Prophet ﷺ. And when we talk about Mu'adh ibn Jabal, I want you to pay attention to this personality. The Prophet ﷺ says, as it narrated by Imam al-Bukhari wa Muslim, خُذُ الْقُرْآنَ مِنْ أَرْبَعَ If you're going to learn the Qur'an other than me, other than from himself ﷺ, learn the Qur'an from four people. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu wa arda Ubay ibn Ka'b Salim Mawla Aba Hudayfa Salim Salim And number four, Mu'adh ibn Jabal These are the four scholars of the Qur'an at the time of the Prophet Who are they? Ibn Mas'ud Ubay ibn Ka'b Salim, Mawla Abu Abba Hudayfa, the friend and the compatriot of Abu Hudayfa. He used to be his slave but was freed. Salim and Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu. When the Prophet died, Mu'adh ibn Jabal was just nearing his 20s. He was still a teenager, so he was a young man. But even though he was a young man, the Prophet ﷺ sent him to the people of Yemen as their governor and instructor in the Qur'an and in the sciences of Islam. And in the authentic hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says to Mu'adh, أَعْلَمُ النَّاسِ بِالْحَلَالِ وَالْحَرَامِ مُعَادِ ibn Jabal. After me, no one knows about halal and haram more than Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Right? So he's not just a regular Sahabi. So I want you to hear these words and pay attention to them. Mu'adh ibn Jabal says, he orders you, learn this knowledge. 
Because when you learn this knowledge, you will develop an awareness of why you should fear Allah. What is the difference between khawf, fear of Allah, and khashya, khashyatullah? Khashya is it's a logical understanding of why you should fear Allah. Why you'll fear Allah is emotional. When you see a funeral, my, your heart softens, you weep. You're afraid to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when you study knowledge and you know what you will face when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you understand why you should be afraid to meet Allah in a way that is sinful in your life, uh, life dealings and, kneeling, uh, and, and dealings. So the difference between al-khawf min Allah, fear of Allah, which is emotional. All of us will fear Allah. But sometimes it's not based on a logical assumption, logical understanding. Khashya. Yakhshawna rabbahum. They are fearful of Allah because they understand why they should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore the, the alim, the one who studies ilm, the one who learns, فَإِنَّ تَعَلُّمِهِ لِلَّهِ خَشْيَةِ It produces in you an awareness of why you should be afraid of Allah. وَطَلَبُهُ عِبَادَةً Seeking it is worship. وَمُذَاقَرَتِهِ تَسْبِيح And its study is tasbih of Allah. How many hadith and verses of the Qur'an have we recited already? We're in the tens, close to a hundred narrations and statements of the Prophet ﷺ and verses from the Qur'an by the end of our discussion today, we have recited many words of the words of Allah, His Nabi and His Sahaba, Ridwanullah alayhim wa alayhi afdalu salah wa atamu taslim. So studying it is tasbih. You're glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wal bahthu anhu jihad. Searching for it is a struggle. It's not easy. It's not easy to take time away from the family and children on a Saturday afternoon. It's not easy to spend money to come to learn. It's not easy to dedicate time and effort and energy. It's not easy when some of the content is a little bit unstimulating and boring or I heard it before. So things are not easy. It requires mujahada. You have to struggle for the ilm. Teaching it to the one who does not know it. لِمَنْ لَا يَعْلَمُهُ صَدَقَةً Teaching it to the one who doesn't know it is a charity. You've given someone something that you have been, you've given them like a charity, like building a water well, you've given someone knowledge, and therefore the Prophet ﷺ says it's at that same level. It earns you reward even after your death. It's like a sadaqatun jariya. وَبَذْلُهُ لِأَهْلِهِ qurba, And sharing it with people worthy of it and knowledgeable of it draws you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the scholars sit together and the imams sit together and the students of knowledge sit together, only good comes from that moment. Al-Imam Abu Muslim al-Khawalani, Al-Imam Abu Muslim, he says, مثل العلماء في الأرض مثل النجوم في السماء The example that we find of the scholars on earth is like the stars in heaven. They are the ones you use to find guidance in the darkness of the desert and the night. Let's hear now Al Imam al Shafi'i goes on to the word, Al Imam al Nawawi goes on to the words of Al Imam al Shafi'i. He says, Qala al Shafi'iyu, Rahmatullahi alayhi, Talabu al Ilm, to seek knowledge, Afdalu min al Salat al Nafila. To sit and study is better than to be engaged in private worship, voluntary worship. For some of us with our righteous niyyah today, it is better for you to sit and study these words of Allah and His Messenger than to be next door in the masjid praying salah. These are the words of Imam al-Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi. Wa qala, and he also said, لَيْسَ بَعْدَ الْفَرَائِدِ أَفْضَلُ مِنْ طَلَبِ الْعِلْمِ Nothing, nothing, after fulfilling the obligations, the five prayers, the siyam, the zakah, the hajj, nothing after the obligations, the faridah, 
is more virtuous than studying your faith, than studying Islam, than studying the religion sent to our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Waqala, this is one of my favorite statements. Qala, man arada dunya fa'alayhi bil ilm. Wa man arada al akhira fa'alayhi bil ilm. The one who wishes to have the delights of the worldly life, let him learn his faith. And the one who wishes to have the delight of the akhirah, let him learn his faith. Allahu Akbar. The one who wants the dunya, study Islam. The one who wants the akhirah, study Islam. It is a no-lose proposition. You will never lose by learning more Qur'an. It will only profit you in the dunya. You will never lose by learning the hadith of the Messenger Muhammad It'll only profit you in the dunya. It will only raise your status in the akhirah. All of the prophets would come to their people with simple words. They would say to them, Ya qawm, Nuh said it, Shu'aib said it, Salih said it, Ya qawm, istaghfiru rabbakum. Remember Allah, make istighfar. Yursil istama'a alaykum midrara. He'll let the heavens open with rain. I know you have too much in KL. But think of, think, think of Saudi Arabia. The skies will open with their rain. وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ And Allah's strength will be your strength. Could you imagine where you walk on this earth and Allah becomes the hand you strike with? Allah become, as the Prophet ﷺ says, He becomes the, the eyes you see with, you see the dunya with taqwa, the hand you are with, the feet that carry you is blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is that possible? You become acquainted with Allah, near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man arada dunya fa'alayhi bil ilm. The one who wants the dunya, learn. Learn about our, our faith and religion. And the one who wants the akhirah, let him learn about his faith. Waqala, Al Imam al Shafi'i also said, man la, man la yuhib al -ilm, the one who doesn't love knowledge, fala khayra fi, there can be no good in him in reality. The one who doesn't find learning a new ayah, a new surah, the meaning of a surah they already know. Who doesn't find that wonderful and engaging and something stimulating to them, let them know that goodness is out of them. They don't have goodness really in them, even if they claim it. The one who isn't, doesn't feel tenderness from learning about Allah and the Messenger Muhammad Wasallam, there is something within them of goodness that is missing. He then continues and says, فَلَا يَكُنْ بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ مَعْرِفَةُ وَلَا صَدَاقَةُ And when you sense that in someone, that they are apprehensive when it comes to learning about faith, they don't want anything to do with it, then never tie yourself to them or have friendship with them. Don't be too intimate in your relationship and friendship with them because their corruption and having goodness removed is something that will affect you. وقال, Al-Imam bin Shafi'i said, Al-ilm muru'atun lah. Knowledge is chivalry, chivalry for a person. You know how everyone, you know sisters, they say, oh, you know, women in general, oh, I like when he opens the door. You know, when he helps me with this and that. This is chivalry, right? This is the art of manliness, right? As, as Muslim men, there's an art to gentlemanness, right? This muru'a is, is, that, is that. So Imam al-Shafi'i says, when you learn, it develops within you those ethics of conduct. It becomes in, in instinctive in you to look away from what is haram, to give your attention to what is good, to be in the service of the one in need, to guard what you say, to... to to, to be protective of, of the weak more than you are in seeking to accommodate the, the mighty and the strong. So it developed within you this muru'ah and this, 
uh, manliness and chivalry that we all seek uh, amongst us. Not, of course, the sisters. Al-Imam al-Nawawi, uh, we're going to take a, a break in five minutes, inshallah, just a little walk around break, five, ten minute break, inshallah, so we can stretch and so on. But I wish to end this discussion with his statement. Where he says that the Prophet ﷺ said, "Man yuridillahu bihi khayran yufaqihu fi al-din, wal khayriyatu fi dunya wal akhira." He concludes this section by saying, "The Prophet said, and we narrated the hadith of Muawiyah in Bukhari and Muslim, that the one who is blessed and the one whom Allah wishes goodness for him." He gives him a firm understanding of this faith. This khayriya, this goodness, is in this life and the next. And he explains to us that this life, the good in this life, is in every facet. When you become a person who learns about the meanings of the verses of the Qur'an that you have memorized, for example, and you find ways to implement them in your life and inculcate them in the activities that you perform and pass them on to others. Just that act alone brings into your world and into your existence barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of a sudden you become chosen from amongst others who surround you. Now barakah, this khayriya, this goodness that descends upon you, that is missing from the one who is not attached to learning about their faith, this barakah is three things. Make note of this insha'Allah. Barakah, when we say, you know, someone gets married, you say, barakallahu lak. Right? May Allah put barakah, blessing. It's usually translated as blessing. In our salah, we say, Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. Right? What's barakah? What, is, what does this mean? Barakah is three things. And this is the goodness of knowledge in this dunya, before the akhirah. Barakah, three things. One, is that what you have is greater than what you think you have. Most of us, we look at something and we say, oh, it's finite in its amount. We don't understand that supernaturally and beyond the realm of this worldly life, that Allah is in control of it. So all of a sudden, a plate in front of you, you say, oh, that's not going to be enough for the three of us to share. And then you do the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. You say, Bismillah, you eat with your right, and you eat from what it's in front of you, and your niyyah is clean, and the people you're eating with is clean. All of a sudden, that meal that you looked at it, thought was not enough, it gives you more nourishment and more satisfaction than if you were to eat it alone. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's barakah. That's from Allah. It's not measurable, it's intangible. That which was a limited amount in your estimation is increased in an unknown measure by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of your usage and satisfaction of it. Number two in barakah, is the harm that was soon to befall you is averted. All of a sudden, you say, Oh Allahumma barik li fi zawjati. Oh Allah, put barakah in my wife. And maybe Allah had written that she would, you know, slip and, and hurt a knee or a back or something. Your dua, it averts a harm. It doesn't add anything to your wife, no extra pounds or anything. All that happens is that something that was going to befall her, an illness that was going to strike her, something that was going to come between you, because of your dua of barakah, it averts that harm. Unknown to you, right? So that's why we say it to newlyweds. Barakallahu lak. May Allah put barakah for you. Wa'alaik, and on you. Wajama'a baynakum and put barakah between you, right? Because you want every facet of their life as an individual, as a, a, a couple, that there is an increase and a prevention of harm, right? The third level of barakah, and the, th the third meaning of barakah, is 
that those around you benefit from you without you doing anything. Those who are with you, you didn't do for them anything, but all of a sudden, because you are in their presence, they are protected or blessed on account of nearness to you. And therefore Allah says about Isa, Isa says, وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُ Wherever I am, there was barakah, there was protection wherever I walked. Wherever Muhammad ﷺ was, there was protection. The Prophet ﷺ said, أَنَا أَمَنَةُ أَهْلِ أهل الْأَرْضِ as long as I'm alive with you, I protect you. The Dajjal won't come, a tsunami won't come, nothing will happen to you. I am with you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Barakah. His presence had barakah. And therefore in his illness, his final illness, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aisha would put his hand on his own chest and she would recite the last two surahs of the Quran. She said, I was seeking the barakah of his hand for himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After the death of the Prophet ﷺ, as is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari, some of the hair of the Prophet ﷺ was kept by his wife, Umm Salama. And whenever someone got sick in Al-Madina and they couldn't find a cure, they would come to Umm Salama's house and she would take the hair of the Prophet ﷺ and put it in a cup of water and they would drink and would immediately get better. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So his physical presence and his nearness to others and his life and his time with them was a barakah and a blessing for those who lived. And in our times, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes knowledge to be a protection for others. I leave you with this hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, where he says the Prophet ﷺ said, the one who recites ayat al-kursi in his home before he or she sleeps, it protects mana'a baytahu wa jarahu. It protects his home and his neighbor. His neighbor's sitting at home watching TV. But because he recited ayat al kursi, it has that protection of him, his home, and those who surround him, those who are nearest to him. May Allah make us a source of barakah for ourselves and others. Wa akhru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Asakhfiruk wa atubu laik. We're going to have, we'll see you back at, Asr is 4.50? 4? Four? 4.11 <laughs> or 4.17. Uh, we, will, we would like to have 45 minutes before the Asr. So if you can be back no later than 3.30, inshallah. Yes? So 15 minutes? Have a little walk around, 15 minutes, and we will start 4, uh, 3.30 sharp, inshallah. And we will continue until 4.11 or 4.10 bi-ibnillahi ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.